The Lord be with you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, we gather this sixth Sunday after Epiphany, and here to tell us more about that is Henry Mazinski. Henry? Today is the sixth Sunday after Epiphany. Epiphany makes means to make known. In this season, Jesus makes known that he has come to help all sorts of people, including those that others reject. In the Beatitudes, he spoke to those that some people might call less fortunate. Jesus calls them those that God loves and blessed. We are among those that God loves, and we are those called to love others. The green, the color for this Sunday after Epiphany is green. Green is the color for the church and for the new life we have been given by our Lord. Thank you, Henry. Today we have a full morning. We welcome Jesse Eddington from the Merrick Community Services um, for our adult education. Jesse will tell us um, a, about the work that Merrick does in our community, including about our partnership and how we get to work with them, providing food at John Glenn on a weekly basis for families that are in need and on a monthly basis with the community market. So if you're able, we hope that you will stay this afternoon um, after our service this morning um, to learn from Jesse more about Merrick Community Services. We have a homestead service this morning as well on the third floor of their homestead. It's our monthly worship service. If you're able to join us, inclined to stop there, we would be glad to have you on the third floor at the homestead. This week is the community market. Um, it's on the 20th. If you are able to help with the community market from 3 to 6 p.m., please visit with Sylvia following our service this morning. Um, community market this coming week. The Mass car Carnival is coming as well. That's on March 6th. If you're able to help with that, that's at John... What? February 28th. Oh, February 28th. I'm so sorry. February 28th. Thank you, Katie. February 28th. Even sooner. Um, if you can help with the Mass Carnival, um, Katie would like to have you there on the right day, on February 28th, to help. You don't need to know Mass to show up to help with the Mass Carnival. Um, just a love for people and an able uh, willingness to help. So you can sign up following the service for that as well. There are two different shifts, and those are between 5.30 and 8.30 on the 28th. Lent is coming, and soup suppers, those are March 6th. March 6th are soup suppers. If you are thinking that you might like to provide a soup or a dessert for Ash Wednesday or any of the following six Wednesdays, please sign up across from the kitchen on the bulletin board. If you're able to help with the setup and cleanup, please sign up. It's always nice to know that the blanks are getting filled. We have a couple youth events coming up. We have a Gustavus retreat February 28th to March 2nd. 6th to 12th graders, if you're able to go, we hope that you will sign up to be part of this Gustavus confirmation, pre-confirmation retreat. You get to eat campus food. You get to stay in a dorm. You get to study in a college classroom. It doesn't get much better. So if you're able to go, please sign up um, on the yellow sheet in your bulletin today. Then our summer youth trip is this summer. It's in July. Our young people with a couple adults, one of which we are still looking for a male chaperone, if you're interested, please talk to myself or Katie Erickson or Bob. We'd love to know if that's something you might be interested in. It's the middle of July. It's a servant trip. It'll be a time of serving on a Native American reservation, learning more about our Native American neighbors. If you are able to go on that trip, please let Katie know. There are also shares being sold in support of that trip. As a shareholder, for $25, you will get a plate at a dinner following the trip, served by our young people, as well as a postcard from our young people while they were on the trip. 
and those will be sold um, following the service today and in the next couple of weeks. We begin our service with confession and forgiveness, found at the red tab in the front of your hymnal. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the Kyrie at the yellow tab in the front of your hymnal. 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, prayer of the day is printed on the front page of your bulletin. Let us pray. Living God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace, and in the renewal of our lives make known your glory through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. The first lesson for the sixth Sunday after Epiphany comes from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17, verses 5 through 10. This can be found in the, in the Old Testament in your pew Bible on page 719. A reading from Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, Cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of the drought, it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious above all else. Is it perverse? Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give all to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. Here ends the first lesson.
The second lesson for the sixth Sunday after Epiphany comes from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 12 through 20. This can be found in the New Testament of your Pew Bible on page 176. A reading from 1 Corinthians. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be, mis- to be misrepresenting God, because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. It is for this life only we have hoped in Christ. We are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. The word of the Lord. gospel is from Luke, the sixth chapter. If you'll turn in your pew Bible to page 64 in the New Testament, we read our gospel lesson together. It's Luke chapter 6, verses 17 through 26. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured, and all in the crowd were trying to touch him. For power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you revile you and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. The Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It was July 4th, 1993 when the call came. The grandpa that I knew best had died that day of a sudden heart attack. I was five hours away from home in my college town working for the summer. A few days later we were driving to the cemetery just outside that tiny rural North Dakota community where someone was mowing and a man was in the field. It looked like life around us carried on as normal when our life had so drastically changed. It was the first death of a close relative that I really remember. And then that man in the tractor stopped at the edge of his field. Close to the road, he turned off his tractor and removed his hat as the processional passed by. We were suddenly in this together, in our grief and honor, maybe a sort of a level place. 
And now we hear that Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place. He was with a crowd of disciples, people from Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. That means they were probably Gentiles as well. He was with a crowd, a variety of people, not only those who were considered faithful, but those who were foreigners, distressed, diseased, troubled with unclean spirits, a crowd of variety longing to touch him and be healed. They didn't all fit the expectation of those in power, of those who decided who would be faithful and not, and certainly not all of them had expressed their belief in the God of Israel. But having heard that Jesus had healed throughout Capernaum, now those crowds were growing, all of them coming with their own expectations and wondering together in that level place. And Jesus' ministry carried on in that place. He didn't keep walking as people were touching him. Instead, his sermon began. You see, he's always bringing about his kingdom. And in what sounds like could have been a chaotic event, he tells what his kingdom means now. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on the count of the Son of Man. Because those poor need a promise. Those in need need the assurance of a Lord who has come and giving his healing and that there is more. The kingdom of God is wherever Jesus is. And now his kingdom is among them. Jesus is the blessing who has come for the weak in that culture, a culture that taught not only that taught only the pure and cleansed, and only the whole and righteous were the strong ones. Not so different from our culture today, where we encourage each other by saying, "You're strong. You'll make it through," and we judge easily, wondering how weak someone really can be. If they've got a degree, how can they be homeless? Or how can they not make fruitful decisions on their own? You know, the culture that tells us we're truly strong when really we have no strength outside of Jesus. No strength outside of his kingdom, at least, the enduring strength with which life can continue. Without this, Lord, we're weak. It's what we sing. They are weak, but he is strong. And in him, there's always more. When Jesus speaks, people gather. When Jesus speaks, care is given and people show up. When Jesus speaks, life happens. Life happens in the midst of crisis and struggle. People come together when a crisis happens. How do we come together when there is no crisis, though? Life is full. Schedules get swamped. How do communities stay connected, at least on a regular basis? Does routine include more than family? Does it include community? What about when we become content, thinking that we have a pretty good plan and we carry on? As much as we are in need, there are times our Lord knows we are content, and we need to hear the reality that in these times we could be drawn in on ourselves, believing that we too can be strong. So his sermon continues with Jesus saying, Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you. Which ties into our text from Jeremiah. Cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength. When we believe we are strong on our own, when we have no life in ourselves, there is no life in the wealth, in material goods, and in the investments we count on. There's only life when material wealth is understood as a gift, a gift from the one who is the true giver. So the contentment we are tempted to find in our material goods, it's not true life. And we're challenged by these warnings and statements of woe. Statements of warning, not statements of damnation. They're not a threat of separation from our Lord of life and healing, but he warns, have pity on those who are rich and those who are full, because if life is content, 
then what more is there to wish for and how much better can life get? If riches and fullness are truly the source of life, then what? What does it mean to have a Lord of life? When priorities are the riches and fullness, the staying content and being happy, then where is life that is shared? Where is the level plane on which our Lord speaks? When life is full and we live in the illusion of exemption from trouble and in the belief that we could be satisfied, then we draw into ourselves. Where, then, is the help? And who is there to lean on? Learning again that there's no life and strength on our own. So this, this is the reality into which Jesus spoke those centuries ago and the reality that still afflicts his children. The reality that we are poor and hungry and in need and the reality that we are rich. Just as that crowd gathered, a variety of believers and a variety of social needs, So we gather. We gather here and in community, in our homes and schools, and when we gather, we're that same sort of crowd. And in the crowd of life, we have this word, Jesus' observation and truth, a word we may not want to hear when we do feel like life is going well, yet a word Jesus knows we need to be directed away from ourselves. His is a word of promise, too when we are reminded that there is more and that our need for stability, our need for good health and a meal is what it means to have the kingdom of God among us. So do you suppose that in hearing these verses we could honestly say that asking for help is faithful? Could we truly say that believing we can have life without community is impossible? And then we watch the news and we wonder Who is our community? It's Maplewood and the Twin Cities. How far do we go to help those across our nation? And how far beyond our borders are we called? How does the wealth of our nation impact the world? And does it make sense that we send aid to those suffering under a struggling Venezuelan leadership? There's so much at stake when we start asking the questions and believing that asking for help is faithful. It opens up all kinds of conversations and really, It's tempting to turn back to ourselves, and then how much do we dial back? It's the source of political conversation and division, and the source of family struggles, too. Living in the promise of the present reality. Jesus says, blessed are the poor, for yours is. Not it will be or might someday get close to the kingdom of God, but yours is. And so we can ask for help from others. And when the ones we love get to be too much, we can ask for help from outsiders and back off, trusting that his kingdom is coming, and it is among us. His kingdom is the kingdom, and that somehow our Lord's work will be done. Not always by us, but trusting that faithfully he shows up for family and community and a world in need. And we pray that by his good grace, We would be part of what it means that his kingdom comes, binding us in our joys and our griefs. In the joys of new life and in the griefs of months and years of diagnosis that seem to drag on. In the joys of retirement and in the grief when stress and worry want to take hold of our very core. May want to take hold, but there is one who holds on tighter. This Lord Jesus, who spoke that day on that level place, drawing that variety of people together, continues to draw his variety of people. Where careers vary, where opinions, politics, and ages all vary, but we have one Lord. Intending that his children see each other, that we care for each other and share this word that keeps us in his grace. In the truth that he speaks, where riches are a gift, but not all in all, where poverty is a struggle, but not the end, and where life together can be faithful. Blessed are you when you are in need, and woe to you who do not see community. Jesus comes. He comes with this word for you and me and all of his beloved, creating community and giving life. Life in him that will not and it does not ever end. Thanks be to God. Amen. 
the peace of God that passes all understanding. Guard and keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
We continue by confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed, found at the blue tab in the front of your hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, and was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We pray for the people of God and all of God's creation. Gracious Lord, you have created all people in your image. We give you thanks for the variety of races and cultures, not only in this world, but in our very community. Enrich our lives by ever-widening circles of fellowship. Show us your work among those who differ from us until our knowledge of you is made perfect in our love for all of your children. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, you taught your ancient people to seek the welfare of the cities in which they lived. Let us command our neighborhood to your care so that social strife and decay would be no more. Strengthen and make clear your purpose for us so that we can care for each other and our community would live in justice and peace for all. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our O oh God, strength of the weak and comfort of sufferers, mercifully hear our prayers and grant your servants the help of your power that their sickness would be turned into health and our sorrow into joy. We pray especially this day for Juliana and Karina, for Jim and Kareen, for Karen, Maria, and Alice, for Alan and Levon, for Britt and Kennedy, for Ben, Javine, Carol, and Ellie, for Julie and Howard, for Michael, Chuck, and Andrew, for Philip and Delight, for Kenton, Matt, and Claire, for Kimmy, Kelly, and Dave, for Kim and Sharon, for Chris, Judy, and Rick, for Rocky and Mary Jo, for Jack and Clara, for Ron, Diane, Marv, and Florence, for Lynn, Richard, and Dennis. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, you teach us in your holy word that you do not willingly afflict or grieve your children. So we pray for those who grieve. Strengthen them in your patience and comfort them with the memory of your goodness, giving them your peace. We pray especially, Lord, for all who loved and now miss Lenore Ryder, Norma Harrisville, Augie Guevara and Dorothy Lupkiss, Jim Milliken, Dick and Gloria Clausen, Harry Erickson, Nola Hovland, Calvin Wilson, Arlo Stack, and Stephen Yembo. Lord, in your mercy. All this and whatever else you see that we need, grant it, Lord, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all.
Our offering prayer is printed in your bulletin. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. We pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> 